welcome to this uh, lecture. So far, we have been looking at the one of the very important but simple real time task scheduler known as the cyclic scheduler. We had seen that uh, the design parameters that need to be decided by the programmer is one is the major cycle which is easy to set which is the LCM of the task periods or the periodic tasks and the minor cycle also called as the frame. And we had seen that the frame needs to satisfy some constraints and we had done some examples. I hope you have understood those examples. Now, let us uh, do one exercise. Please work out on your pen and paper. Let us look at the exercise. So, here in this problem, we have three periodic tasks T 1, execution time is 1 and the period is 4, deadline is 4. Task 2, execution time is 1 and period and deadline are 5 units. Task 3, execution time is 1.5 units, the task period and deadline are 20 units and we need to derive the schedule for this. And once we derive the schedule, it can be stored as the schedule for one major cycle and then the cyclic executive will keep on fetching the next task on each frame interrupt. So, just asking what will be the major cycle for these three tasks T 1, T 2, T 3. We have the task periods as 4, 5 and 20. We know that the major cycle is the LCM of T 1, T 2 and T 3. So, that would get 20 as the major cycle. I hope everybody is getting that. Now, the next thing is to select the frame size and we have to see that it satisfies three constraints. The first constraint is that the frame size must divide the major cycle and major cycle is 20 and that gives us some discrete values. So, the frame sizes that are possible are I hope you are also getting the same thing that 1, 2, 4, 5, 10 and of course, 20. The second con constraint will put a lower bound on the frame size which is that the execution time of each task must be accommodated in one frame and that gives us that the frame size must be greater than each of the task execution times. So, 1, 1, 1 1.5. So, the task execution time has to be at least 2. So, 1 is ruled out. So, now we have to choose between 2, 4, 5, 10 and 20. Now, the third constraint which says that there must be a clear frame between the arrival of a task and the deadline and that if we ensure for the worst case, then it will hold for all cases. So, for each task we have to check 2 into f minus g c d f comma p i should be less than equal to d i. So, that we need to do for all the three tasks for the different frame sizes. Let us start with the frame size 2. 
please try. So, this is what I have written down here. So, the major cycle is 20 that everybody would have got and the frame sizes are 2, 4, 5, 10 because one is ruled out that do not hold the task executions. So, now let us try the frame size 2 for the third constraint 2 into f minus g c d f comma p 1 the period of the task 1 is 4 and therefore, 4 minus 2 which is 2 is less than equal to the d 1 the deadline for task 1 which is 4 which is holds. Okay. We check for the second task with frame size 2, we do the similar thing here g c d f comma 5 and f is 2. So, 4 minus 1 which is also less than equal to 5, so this is ok and similarly we check for the third task f comma 20. So, f is 2 and therefore, the g c d is 2 and again this holds. So, 2 is a possible frame size, but what about the number of frames that are required by the schedule. So, the frame sizes if you see here are 4, 5 and 20. So, in one major cycle the third task will occur once, the second task will occur 4 times and the first task will occur 5 times. So, 5 plus 4 1 plus 5 plus 4 9 plus 1 is 10. So, we need at least 10 frames and therefore, this just holds f equal to 2. Now, let us see for frame size 4. The frame size 4 uh, we again look at the deadline constraint that there must be a clear frame between the task arrival and the deadline and that is given by the expression the worst case is given by the expression 2 into f minus g c d f comma p i and we see here for the second task it does not hold. And also if we think how many frames will be available in one major cycle, we see that there are 5 frames because frame size is 4 and therefore, there will be 5 frames that will be available and here for the 3 tasks we need 10 frames. So, f equal to 4 is not suitable first is it violates the deadline constraint and not enough frames are available to develop the schedule. And therefore, no point in looking for frame size 5, 10 etcetera, because the number of frames available will be still less. So, frame size 4 is sorry frame size equal to 2 is the one that can be chosen. And once we have the frame size 2, then we can easily develop the schedule which frame in which frame which task will execute. But what happens if we try out all possible frame sizes and find that none of the frame size is suitable. If we think of it the major culprit in this case is a task with large execution time. For example, if we have many tasks with execution time of 3, 4, 5 etcetera and there is one with 20 100 100. Obviously, the frame size need to be large here 20 at least and the number of frames will become less. So, only let us say the major cycle is 100 number of frames becomes 5 
and not only that the deadline constraint will also be violated. So, how do we get about by when we have a large with a task with large execution time? We need to bit of rewrite our program and we need to split this task into smaller tasks. So, let us assume that we split it into let us say 10 and 10. We look at the code and then decide what can be a possible smaller task size. So, that same task we need to split into two and obviously, we must ensure that end of the task let us say we make it uh, the T 1 is uh, T 1 A and T 1 B. So, T 1 A at the end of T 1 A it must leave the system with a consistent state. So, that even if other tasks they execute they should not get inconsistent values similar with T 2 uh, sorry T 1 B. So, whenever we cannot really get any feasible frame size, we need to split the tasks with longer execution times. We will not go into details of that, just given the indication and based on that it would not be really very difficult to again rework on the frame size and see that if a feasible schedule can be developed. So, as you can see that this is a iterative process sometimes we do not get correct uh, frame size that we can use and in that case we need to restructure the tasks and again look for uh, feasible frame size. So, now we conclude on this uh, cyclic scheduler we look at more sophisticated schedulers, but before that let us just recapitulate on what are the strong points and weak points of this uh, cyclic scheduler. The strong point is that it is a simple and efficient task scheduler. The executive program is very small just needs to consult the schedule table and each time it gets a frame interrupt it uh, just runs the task that is there on the schedule table. It is more efficient even than a table driven scheduler because repeatedly setting a timer is not required here, the timer is set only at the initialization time. Now, let us look at the negative points for the cyclic scheduler. The first point is that how do we really develop the schedule when the number of tasks become large like uh, slightly non trivial uh, ex uh, application where the number of tasks are let us say 10 or 15. Manually looking at all developing the major cycle finding out candidate frame cycles and then trying to check every constraint is actually non trivial and that too it is a iterative task. So, as the number of tasks increases it may become very difficult for the designer to find a frame size that is one problem with this scheduler. The second one is that it is uh, difficult to modify and maintain. What if we need to just uh, incorporate a new device and therefore, the execution time of one of the tasks become longer. So, in this case we have to entirely rework the schedule it is not just that we change the schedule for that task we need to rework for the entire schedule has to be reworked new frame size and so on. These are fragile because if for any reason one of the tasks takes longer then it may leave the system in inconsistent state and it the system may fail. Also in many applications we have sporadic and aperiodic tasks and there is no clear way 
in which you can handle the sporadic and aperiodic tasks. So, these are the weak points of the cyclic scheduler, you must uh, remember that. Now, let us look at more sophisticated schedulers. The clock driven schedulers are simple, used in simple applications, but as the applications become more sophisticated, we need to deploy the event driven schedulers. Let us look at the event driven schedulers, the major classes of event driven schedulers and the issues that need to be handled. Compared to the clock driven schedulers, these are more proficient. What does that mean? It means that for a given task set, even if a clock driven scheduler cannot find a schedule, it can be easily executed or the a feasible schedule can be obtained using the event driven scheduler. So, these are more proficient this can handle the sporadic and aperiodic tasks and naturally these are used more complex applications, but these are not as efficient as the clock driven scheduler both in terms of the code size of the schedulers and also the execution time of the schedulers. But then for event driven schedulers, what will be the scheduling points? If you recollect, we had said that as long as we are discussing about uh, task schedulers, one of the very fundamental concept is the scheduling point. The scheduling point are the times at which the task scheduler becomes active, starts running and decides which task to dispatch or start execution next. So, what will be the scheduling points for event driven scheduling? So, there are two scheduling points, two types of scheduling points, one is task completion. So, whenever a task is running and it completes that wakes up the scheduler that defines a scheduling point and the scheduler starts running and tries to decide which task to run the next. The other scheduling point, other type of scheduling point are the arrival events. When a task arrives, we know that the tasks arrive due to an interrupt may be a periodic task can arrive due to a clock interrupt, a periodic timer interrupt. So, each time the periodic timer interrupt occurs, the corresponding instance of that task which is called as a job is released or it is becomes ready to execute. So, the arrival of every task sorry every instance of a task that is a job defines a scheduling point. So, as the job arrives the scheduler code starts running and checks whether this is a task which has arrived needs to be executed by preempting the already executing task. So, the event driven schedulers are also called as preemptive schedulers, because whenever a task arrives and it has a higher priority, then the task that is already executing needs to be preempted. The simplest event driven scheduler goes by the name foreground background scheduler. So, this you might have already been become familiar in your uh, first level operating system course, the basic operating system course. The foreground background scheduler is a popular scheduler uh, even in non real time applications. If you recollect the basic ideas in a foreground background scheduler, 
here we have a mixture of periodic, aperiodic and sporadic tasks. The periodic tasks run in the foreground that means that they are given high priority compared to the background tasks. Whenever the foreground tasks do not exist, the background tasks start running and in a real time situation, all the tasks having real time deadline are run as the foreground tasks. So, these are the periodic tasks which have deadline I just shown here one example in this diagram. If you see here that uh, this uh, line here defines the point at which the periodic task real time periodic task recurs. And since this is a real time task, it is a foreground task. So, it starts running displacing all other background tasks. So, as it completes, then the background tasks start running. And again, as the periodic timer interrupt comes, the periodic task again becomes it arrives or be, is uh, becomes ready and as soon as it becomes ready it starts running so this is the first instance of the periodic task and as it started running the background tasks are to wait and after its completion at this point the background tasks start running until the clock interrupt comes, the periodic timer interrupt at which the second instance of the periodic task starts running and it completes only then the other aperiodic and sporadic tasks start running. So, it is a simple scheduler where as long as there is a foreground task it, it runs. And in a more complicated case, there might be multiple types of foreground tasks. So, in that case, the scheduler will choose the highest priority foreground task. And only when none of the foreground tasks exist, then the background task will run. So, this is a simple scheduler, we will just do a problem based on this. So, before we do the problem, let me just uh, give you a mathematical expression. If T b is the background task and processing time is E b. So, the background task we do not consider them having a deadline. So, we just indicate the background task by its execution time. Whereas, the foreground task is P 1 and its execution time is E 1 or we might have a set of foreground tasks. We indicate the execution time by E i and the period P i. So, in that case, how long will the background task take to complete? The formula is simple here. If you look at the formula, E b is the execution time of the background task and each time the task E i T i starts executing, it will run for E i and out of every p i units the task t i will execute for e i. So, the fraction of time it will run is e i by p i. If we consider all such periodic tasks we can write sigma e i by p i. So, the fraction of time that is left out for the background task to run can be given by 1 minus sigma E i by P i. 
and therefore, the completion time of the background task can be expressed as E b is the execution time of the background task divided by 1 minus sigma E i by P i. So, let us do one exercise. Let us consider there is a, a sim, very simple case where there is only one real time task which is periodic. The period is 50, sorry, the execution time is 50, the period is 100, and the deadline is 100. Uh, I just written here P1, it should be E1, and this should be P1. So, execution time is 50, period is 100, and deadline is 100. And the background task, the execution time is 1020 millisecond. So, what will be the completion time of the background task? That is the question. The answer to this is that every time the foreground task runs, it uh, runs for 50 millisecond and it runs once every 100 millisecond. So, the rest of the 50 millisecond is available for the background task to run. So, the utilization due to the foreground task is 50 by 100 or 0.5. So, the time fraction of time available for the background task is 0.5. So, you can just substitute that in an expression 1020 by 50 by 100 which is uh, 2040 millisecond. So, the background task will complete in 2040 millisecond. So, the background task, the foreground background scheduler is a very simple scheduler, even covered in a first level operating system course. We just reviewed it because it has relevance uh, for real time applications, uh, but we will not discuss too much on this. We will look at more sophisticated schedulers, the RET monotonic scheduler and the earliest deadline first scheduler. Uh, but we will take that up in the next lecture. Now, for this lecture we will stop here.